Welcome. This final talk is on cure, care and research, given by me, Shibri Raman, on 17th of September 2015. And it's easy to underestimate how much progress our quote has there has been in English dementia policy. Now, to give you an example, here was a letter addressed to the Prime Minister dated 7th May 2014, which outlined some key achievements. The authors of the letter obviously did go on to point out a colossal number of other achievements, but in I would like you to note uh, three things of theirs. An increase in diagnostic rates since March 2012, over 50 communities across England, well, commonly there's much more, of course, and research spending has increased by nearly 50% since 2010. This overall represents three arms of policy at the moment for England in dementia, cure, care and research. And unfortunately, this is the current way in which dementia quite often is depicted in the media. Use of words, sufferers, battle, wars, fights, a very aggressive time bomb, um, all geared up in a shock doctrine way to do something about it, whether that be give time to research or give some money even. There is, of course, a human face to dementia and I never see dementia as a, a physical disease process. I think of friends who are living with dementia. One of the long-term conditions, here's of course Chris and my other good friend Helga. So this talk is going to be about um, some insights for me, if that's not a tautology on cure, care and research. The latest policy document and there have been several, almost to the point of one a year. It's, of course, Prime Minister's Challenge on Dementia 2020. Often these days, these policy documents tend to be front-loaded with the so-called I statements, and it's worth having a look at these uh, before I move on, and they all seem pretty reasonable. The question is how, of course, you put them into action. For example, I can expect a good death. Well, you'd be aware of people who haven't had a good death. I have the knowledge to get what I need. Often people find their knowledge rather lacking, rather transparent, rather opaque. For example, in the choice of care homes. So, I'm going to during this talk in the next 50 minutes, outline some of the things from this 2020 document. Whenever you see something in bold, this will mean that I've taken a statement, I've lifted it out of the document, have not amended it. And this is the ambition rather than target. For example, improve public awareness and understanding of the factors which increase the risk of developing dementia. Well, I explained previously in a previous talk that probably half of dementia is not caused by something in the air, so to speak. The ambition to live more healthily is to directly combat the issue that many people in the public think that nothing can be done to prevent dementia, which is not quite true. And the healthy ageing campaign, well, of course, this is difficult territory because dementia is not confined only to old people. Notwithstanding that the risk of dementia shoots up as you get older. For example, if you're above 75, you have quite a high chance of living with dementia, and extraordinarily so if you're approaching 100. And the right to a diagnosis is 
pretty much something we can all agree on. There are various reasons which I've gone into before why people do not seek a diagnosis or maybe why clinicians aren't ready to make the diagnosis. A diagnosis obviously is a massive event for all concerned and the idea that most people feel that the diagnosis is worth waiting for but should not be extraordinarily delayed. And there have been various permutations and combinations of the enhanced service specification from uh, NHS England. Uh, GPs are working very tight demands and among these demands, facilitating timely diagnosis and support for dementia. Of course, um, the diagnosis is a crucial part of the process, but whether you can say the entire care perspective is down to diagnosis is of course um, hot air, it isn't. The issue is what construes, comprises post-diagnostic support. And therefore the idea has come out that care ought to be meaningful. And to support this there are various standards and really is nice. And nice are currently uh, reviewing the standards for dementia, which used to be CG42. Now, here's a section from my book um, uh, in which I quote, We are a long way from an Alzheimer's cure. Uh, many people with dementia have in fact asked me, Shibli, if we have a cure, what will it look like? And this, of course, is a very pertinent question. Will it be a pill you can take? Will it be a vaccine to prevent you getting dementia, so to speak? What sort of dementia are we talking about? Is it one of the 120 dementias for some Alzheimer's? Whether you like it or not, there is a bit of friction between cure and care. And the friction is a concrete one for economists. They have to reconcile across the jurisdictions how much money they want to spend on cure versus care. It is well known that the social care budget has plummeted in England in the last five years artifactually and more due to the lack of ring fencing of the social care budget. We all await the comprehensive spending review with much interest. I will have explained in a previous lecture about choice and control, and you will perhaps remember me talking about personal budgets, unified budgets. I've referred to it in not only the lecture on choice, but also the lecture on whole person care. Now, if you go the full hog of the right neoliberal set articulation, then you could argue that the general public ought to know how much arsat and galanthamine and all these drugs cost, meaning that if they ultimately have to pay for it or feel as that they are paying for it, they can make a rational decision to choose something more efficacious, perhaps, or even more cheap, for some social prescribing, for example, an iPod to improve well-being as a result of listening to music. So, in a way, you can argue the policy has not gone far enough. Now, the Barbican consensus um, will be emerging at some stage. It's where a bunch of people from K England, CQC, NS England, etc., uh, and the sort of linchpin's policy uh, met up to decide what will post diagnostic support look like. And Here's the crunch, life planning immediate and can sport. Now, there's a bit of a, a subtle point here, not very subtle if you're into it, but one can argue that the care plans should not be suddenly launched just as somebody's about to die for obvious reasons, and the care plan ought to be given quite soon after a diagnosis to maybe include speech and language, physiotherapy, OT, etc. So, personalised care plans involving the carer and the person with dementia and the uh, trained staff um, should be there as early as possible. New models of care 
of course, to exist. The famous fi- five year forward view from NS England proposed care models, uh, which propose that these care models, including vanguards, rather hyperbolically termed, ought to be part of the solution for health and care economies, rather than struggling away in the old way. I'm going to now change gear a bit and talk about the future. The future is here, according to Jeremy Hunt and others, and of course it is in a way, in a sense. Disability and dementia go together like peas in a pod. Dementia is in fact a disability under the regulations for the Care Act, the guidance rather, for the Care Act 2010. Now, cognitive impairments, including problems with memory, are fundamental to all dementias. Interventions which target these cognitive deficits and the associated difficulties with activities of daily living are the subject of ever-growing interest. We therefore need well-designed studies of cognitive training and rehab uh, to provide evidence. And with evidence, it makes it easier to sell, literally, the idea to commissioners. Notoriously, many have been aghast at the lack of ease with which England has responded to the challenge of having a care plan, a uh, care pathway, rather. Now, I wonder simply if the reluctance of some to introduce care pathways is to not give prominence to care plans, but that, of course, would be overly cynical. Now, NICE in April 2013 uh, produced a commissioning tool, and care pathways are meant to, pardon the word, empower people, as indeed Bernard Gus, Gus argued. And yet, these sort of headlines are fairly commonplace in the Guardian and other newspapers. Breast cancer care quality threatened by lack of special nurses. Well, of course, in the current uh, offering from Cancer Research UK, achieving world class cancer outcomes, they did quite recently pick up special nurses. And I agree. Why do I agree? Because people with dementia have the highest, amongst the highest levels of multi-morbidity amongst any long-term condition. The number of these tends to predict with fairly reasonable ease poor outcomes and poor quality service response. Should we manage these, uh, point out correctly, that people with long-term conditions, dementia, report uh, fewer symptoms uh, than those do, who do, are living without dementia. This is really important. And is this comorbidity, which one can argue makes dementia particularly interesting? And we want to celebrate good care but we also want to analyse with some rationality what is exactly happening in the care system. Not an easy job. There have been many disappointed people in the past. While well, celebrating good care has been found that bad care is often accompanied by people who fall beneath the cracks in the pathway. In other words, discontinuities in the care coordination such as moving into a home, such as moving into a hospital, temporarily. Now, CQC between 2013-14 carried out a review uh, of people with dementia, uh, moving into care homes and acute hospitals, and overall they found good care, uh, obviously not a message the media necessarily love. And there's a drug quote, uh, overall, they found more good care than poor care in the care homes and hospitals. Our investors, uh, investors visited apologize that you should have inverted commas. However, the landscape is changing. 
Many people do not, in fact, want to live in a residential setting, a family decision often. And the UK Home Care Association estimates that 60% of people receiving care at home have some form of dementia, and that there is a minimum standardised training and sufficient workforce development uh, not in place. Incredible. Something has to be done about this. So here's one for the future. And with the cost of regulation increasing, um, uh, some would argue too much money being spent in weighing the pig rather than fattening the pig, the Low Pay Commission has noticed a high turnover of staff, and often they can't even uh, be given the national living wage, however so defined. I think there's a general feeling that we need to improve the general level of training for initial staff, whether general specialists, and um, this includes all newly appointed healthcare assistants and our colleagues in the social care workforce who also have experienced rather hefty cuts in their budget in training. And uh, here's a statement from 2020, but I think it should be, should be understandable. All hospitals and care homes meeting agreed criteria to become a dementia-friendly health and care setting. Well, unfortunately, there are too many places which purport to be dementia-friendly, which aren't. I know, for, uh, for instance, that in the dementia-friendly wards last night, there was a recognition of a dementia-friendly surgery, and long may that continue. I'm sure the NHS and social care professionals and practitioners will want to work together with the voluntary sector to move towards a common aim of improving dementia friendliness, however so to find dementia inclusiveness, dementia accessibility for all. Now, I'm particularly interested in the idea that just because you have dementia, it doesn't preclude you from living with other conditions, which I've already introduced as comorbidity. Now, I think the challenge will be to look at groups of populations who live together with more than long -term, one more than one long-term condition. For example, frailty and dementia or repeated faults and dementia. Now, CAMs live as part of an extended ecosystem with hospitals and hospices and GP surgeries. And here's an interesting paper uh, from a number of well-known academics on ambulance service and CAMs. About the heavy slide, it shows that colas can be a whole manners manner of general medical symptoms, a note though, however, falls. And that's what we're generally trying to uh, promote in policy, that people who need to go to acute hospital should obviously do so promptly without any delay. However, um, we should also analyse um, why people end up in acute care now, whether whether something could have been done earlier to prevent an acute admission. Not that the message is that all acute admissions are failures of primary care, not at all. Here's the stats. 2,000 people live in the community, and hence the, <coughs> back your button, hence the importance of dementia-friendly communities. Only one-third live in care homes. Dementia friends tends to be a bit of a marmite issue in that you tend to either love it or hate it. I am a dementia friends champion, uh, and this means I devote one hour once a month to explain to the general public 
in the format of Dementia Friends, what Dementia is, what Dementia is. And I, I think the turnout, while it's not colossal for me, is better than nothing in that I educate people who didn't know anything about dementia, more or less. And a recent um, evaluation presented by Jeremy Hughes uh, presented that 61% feel more confident interacting with people with dementia <coughs> that of course is a staggering statistic and the uptake of the standard which really should be called specification has been very encouraging over half of people living in areas that have been recognised as being dementia friendly according to the new specification. This is another ambition, I'm not entirely sure about this myself, but anyway, there's an idea big corporates might become dementia friendly too. And their people they will be serving as clients who will be living with dementia. I dare say they'll have people living with dementia amongst their staff. And there's a role here for leadership across all areas of society. And a key part of promoting this leadership culture has been the Dementia Action Alliance. Now, I'm going to move on to research and care. Uh, here's the ambition about Charles Greer. Now, actually, a lot of people who go into dementia research exit quite soon for some reason. I don't know why. I did my own PhD in dementia in 1970, 2000, so I've been on and off in it a long time. But I think this, uh, the situation of dementia research has in fact never been better for the UK. And obviously the UK punishes well above its weight. And this has been possible through public private partnership between patients, researchers, funders and of course the bind from society. Now, funding for dementia research is on track, it is said to be doubled by 2025. Overall, dementia research funding has lagged by the other big hitters, AIDS, cancer, etc. There may be ageism there, I don't know. As, an, as a way to uh, address this, on 17th of March 2015, there was a $100 million dementia discovery fund launched. And here I would like to thank the contribution of uh, pharma, government, and of course, crucially, Alzheimer's Research UK. Now, this fund was announced at WHO in their first ministerial conference. The aim is to there was a moment to develop pioneering drugs to treat the condition. Of course, it begs the question, what is the condition? Uh, some feel that the policy has become overwhelmingly Alzheimer'sized. In other words, a um, bust was Alzheimer's disease. But it happens that the majority of dementias are of the form of dementia, the, the Alzheimer type. And in fact, there are other uh, drug initiatives just looking at similar pathways, for example, the tau pathway in frontotemporal dementia. And there's going to be a new International Dementia I Institute. Now, here's a man I used to work for across the road, Professor Martin Ross, a great man. He's a very kind man, if you ever get to meet him. He's NIHR Director for Dementia Research. I'm going to 
giving an overview of the five prongs of Martin's job as it was originally defined, halfway through I'll explain something else which will become clear to you. Number one, an international action plan. In other words, coordinating what we do in England and the UK with the rest of the world, number one. Number two, championing research. No, uh, no mean feat. I think there's much more of a research culture than there has been, say, when I was doing my PhD more than 50 years ago. And uh, for those of you who will have been keeping up to date with the news, you will have seen Tim Kelsey's uh, departure Im- imminently from December, that is, from NS England uh, over the fury. It nay fiasco, some would argue, over NS caretaker. And there's been an initiative which has been not a fiasco, but incredibly successful, called Joint Dimension Research. A sort of dating agency where you can get paired up with an uh, initiative of your choice. And it works really well. You don't have to be living with dementia or caring somebody with dementia to take part. And number four is obviously facilitating the research. I'd like here to introduce Simon Lovestone and the translational research work. Now, uh, here's a fairly common picture of the human brain. They see the ventricles and uh, lighting up with various colours. I don't know what for. The NIHR Dementia Translationally, a Translational Research Collaboration. Now, this fosters the idea that what happens in the lab can hopefully improve clinical practice. Now, this was a major deal in picking up national dementia research, in that people using the NHS could see. Ideally, not just altruistic benefit, but direct benefit to the way in which they are looked after. Maybe participate in more trials, as has been more commonplace for cancer. So here you go, translationary research, translational research. Number one, patient stratification. Biomarkers, people at risk of disease. This has been a horn's nest of issues to do with cancer droppers of who will are uh, suitable to carry on with their drug trials. Number two, developmental therapies. There may be some people who are more risk than others with dementia. Uh, I won't say more about it here, but hence the issue about transport dementia early on, even it is argued before the onset of symptoms. Now, how feasible that will be, I have no idea. Number three, identification of the new disease-causing genes, possible with the new big data explosion. Number four, discovery or discoveries from young onset to older groups, and um, probably be on the card up vice versa. Number five. Uh, understanding basic protein biology. Well, uh, this is interesting for me because some of the proteins have um, overwhelmingly been thought to have a big role to play in dementia. Um, not just Alzheimer's, but things like alpha and trypsin deficiency, the serpentopathies, etc. And then um, uh, here we go back to Martin, living well with dementia. I would prefer to call this living better with dementia. And uh, there's a uh, water battery the, about this. The water battery is what about the 47 million people in the world currently living with dementia? Uh, to use a horrible term, what is the offering for them? What are we going to show them that we're improving dementia care? 
can't just be 100 k by 2025, sorry, I back around 2025. Some of these people who've made such promises won't even be in their jobs by then. And number six is building research capacity and breaking down barriers to research. More about that later. Now, uh, this, uh, this is strong stuff and fast moving. His slide on biomarkers, uh, the surrogate markers, we may spot Alzheimer's disease, but note the warning other genetic and environmental factors modulate this risk. What is so many trials fail? Well, of course, understanding this is obviously a key to understanding the current barriers to uh, doing effective research. And here we have yet further confirmation that biotech's devices, diagnoses, SMEs, the universities, research charities, and interests, plus it all in it together. Uh, to find degrees, of course, uh, for reasons I've explained, with the uh, social care service on its knees. Now, there are the staff cures or disease modifying therapies, none by the which have been approved for NICE yet. Uh, by 2025, 25, allow, allowing collaboration cooperation between people. This requires a bit of uh, footwork from the regulators, encouraging data sharing. There are issues, of course, to do with confidentiality and disclosure, which are not only ethical, but legal issues. Now, Amyloid hypothesis not to uh, go into this at all, but it's built up of this wrong stuff called amyloid in the brain, disproportionately in people with Alzheimer's, one of the branches. But note there are problems with this hypothesis. And this hypothesis, by the way, has been underpinning many of the strives, tr strivings for treatment. Here are four concerns, for example. Number one, amyloid deposition does occur in cognitively normal individuals. Number two, why are plaques President in cognitively normal individuals. Number three, how the amyloid causes toxic problems is a subject of study. Number four, Alzheimer's before Alzheimer's, so to speak, may not be representative of actual human disease. In other words, the animals may be a bit science fiction y. Now, I found this section from a paper quite interesting. Around 50% of people over the age of 85 have Alzheimer's. Now, this rises to 78% of centenarians meet the criteria for mild confusion or severe dementia based on cognition. And they consist a plethora of independent reports looking at barriers to integration research is one of them and here are their recommendations and um, basically they want regulators to be supported and spared clinical development with a so-called accelerated regulatory pathway well of course uh, the Acceleration must not be at the expense of causing damage or uh, harm to people currently giving up time to participate in these trials. Alzheimer's Research UK have been well known for being at the top of the um, people interested in, in spirit research drives in the UK. And uh, there was a new parliament this year, it seemed a long time ago now. Uh, but anyway, in the first budget, they wanted a commitment to world class research. Now, I would add that this should not just be research in drugs or molecules, but also should, also should be research into iPods music, art, uh, human therapy, for example. 
other things which can improve quality of life, and of course the big one, how to improve care homes. Now, here's a meme I don't particularly agree with called Care for Today and Cure for Tomorrow. In that, I think we should care for tomorrow as well, etc. Now, it depends how far one can dream. The dream is a good one of trying to eradicate dementia. But then, then here's the question. Even if we start to eradicate dementia, what about the 4 to 7 million people with dementia currently living? I feel these are noble and good ambitions. Uh, research is a priority for the Alzheimer's Society. And that uh, they talk about the shortfall between dementia and HIV and AIDS. Where it can be argued that more progress has perhaps been made and more progress has been made, for example, in some of the cancers, such as melanoma. Now, the past is littered with casualties of drug trials. Solanizumab is one of them. I wrote an article, probably at the time of Alzheimer's Association conference, entitled Amoid Busting Drugs, True Weapons of Mass Destruction by Aiden Puffy, in other words, hyperbolic claims. Now, here are people other than me who have quibbled with the approach. None of the tested treatments have produced a discernible functional recovery or altered the course of disease. Now, anti amyloid drugs, in particular, are the agents used initially that were not properly validated and were flawed, is claimed. And more research should be done into effective service models and effective pathways uh, to enable interventions to be implemented across the health and care sectors. Now, this statement is from 2020. Now, I've shoehorn that statement here into the Alloy discussion to make the point that even if you find a drug that works for amyloid, the question is how to make it available in the NHS. And we know the NICE have previously not approved drugs which were too costly. So there's Rob. Even at the end of this process, the NHS could just say no. Louis Doxford does an enormous amount of work living with uh, dementia on the World Dementia Council in and um, discussing the various issues concerning this and there were many and part of how to make Hillary's job easier is to make all the results available openly to everyone. Now, here are the four planks of the work of the World Dementia Council. One, integrated development, people working together. Number two, finance and incentives. Well, somehow, that's if you believe in the market for this, then you have to incentivize what can be argued to be a failed market in that if the drugs don't work, they have to be given a the farmer have to be given some way of making it worthwhile. Number three, open science. And this uh, is something that's a major plank in our English policy too. Number four, public health prevention. Now this messaging of healthy body, health mind is a big one. And the idea links back also to my famous uh, try about, about comorbidity. Just because you have a dementia doesn't mean you stop treating everything else. And here I'd like to point out again joint dementia research um, and due to efforts, uh, not least by my friend Chris Roberts, who is living with dementia, Alzheimer's and vascular dementia in Redland Wells, who's been 
giving up a lot of his time voluntarily to poor out research. We really has after him. Here's a bigger t shirt for a bigger man. Here's me bigger in uh, size, that is, of girth, not bigger in others has it, but here's my t shirt, help beat dementia. And he really is a big man, uh, the late Terry Pratchett, with a simple message It's possible to live well with dementia and write bestsellers like what I do. So, in summary, I've given an overview of cure, care, and research. In the last few months, I've given these talks pro bono, no charge for the general public on what current England's English dementia policy is. I started in June. I thank Grace Walfer, who came, was in the audience. Really happy times. Dementia friendly communities. Number two, choice, budgets, or human rights. Number three, integrated care and whole care. Number four, cure, care, and research. Last year, the Alzheimer's Disease International Conference was held in Perth, Western Australia. Jane, Chris and I took a evening to visit Azrock and there's Chris looking into the distance and thanks for listening to my talk tonight and Chris and I often remark and the same for cure, care and research that anything can happen to anybody at any time. Thanks very much.